Pray with me. Jesus, you do reign forever. You are reigning now. You are enthroned. You are seated at the right hand of your father and you shall come back for your people. You shall come back to finally put a, a death to death. You shall come back to raise your people to life eternal. And your kingdom will never end. That it knows no limits. It knows no bounds. You are a sovereign and good and powerful king. It is a joy. It is a privilege to bow in your presence. It is a privilege. It is a treat to be able to sit and let our king shepherd and lead and protect and fight for us. And so that's what we want to do. We want you to show up. We want you to meet us and we want you to be God in our midst. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you uh, have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 15. Not 15, John chapter 12. I'm tripping. All right, John chapter 12. All right, we're going to start at verse 12, and I'll read down to uh, verse 28. This is the word of the Lord. And the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. And so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that we you are gaining nothing. Look, the world is gone after him. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus and Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Amen. It's the reading of God's word. Have you ever noticed that we are fascinated or drawn to people who have this amazing sense of power and strength? and accomplishment, who at the same time are humble and meek and approachable. Like there is something about those two things when they're met and when they're married that it's just outright attractive. I say that because it's probably the reason why some of your most famous, some of your favorite famous people, you don't just like them because they've done famous things. You like them because of what they do when they're not in, in you know, public eye. You, you like those famous people who have funds that work in the community, that there is something about seeing someone with that title or those accolades who are at the same time present amongst us. You, does that make sense? That, that there's something to Seeing strong people still be weak. It's the reason why when little girls are growing up, they want a strong man. That They dream of a knight in shining armor, and they want him to be able to cry as well. That, that, that we want that strength, and we want that 
married to humility and tenderness. It's the same reason that uh, some of, you know, if you listen to rap, some of your favorite rappers might be those guys, not just who can spit on bars, but those guys who have not forgotten where they've come from, that they, they are not afraid to go back into the neighborhoods that, that made them, that, 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 that you know, you've made it, you've, you've made it, you, you are a big shot now, and yet you will not forget us little people. Uh, I think it's the reason why I'm fascinated by Kawhi Leonard, and you might not have, you don't even have to know who he is, but there's an article that came out, I think it was last week about him, and he's probably the Spurs' best player right now, and that's saying a lot. He's the one of three guys who has not only won the, the defensive player of the year, but also the finals MVP. The only other two men who've ever done that is Hakeem Olajuwon and Michael Jordan. So we're talking about a guy with accolades, and yet the article was not about his accolades. It was about what he's like off the court. He refuses to cut his cornrows out. He's losing out on tons of money of endorsements. He signed a $94 million contract, and he still uses coupons to go eat at Wingstop. <laughs> right? He still owns a two-bedroom apartment that he lives in in the off-season to train. That the day that he signed his $94 million contract, he showed up in sweats, he signed it, and he left. He would not even stay to be interviewed. He says, I, I have work to go do. And he still drives a 1997 Chevy Tahoe. There's something about that image. You make this much money, you've won an NBA championship, you're the most, one of the most versatile players in the league, and yet you're down to earth. That, that strikes a chord in all of our hearts. And yet, you live long enough, you realize that you'll never see that perfectly in a human. That, that same person who's famous, that yeah, they'll start a charity, but you won't see them when the lights go out. That same concert you go to see, they might crowd surf in, but as soon as the, the concert is over, security is protecting them, right? That, that, that husband that you thought would be this amazing guy and strong and tender, he struggles to fight his own sin. That, that he has a hard day at work and he doesn't want to share his feelings. That even Kawhi Leonard, when you do a little more research, he's not really all, you know, I mean, he owns a Porsche. And so that, that kind of, that ruined it for me, right? I'm thinking like, man, that's all he has is a 97 Tahoe, my dude. And then you keep reading, wait a minute, you, you drive a Porsche. And so I, I think that, that, that you just never find it perfectly in a human. And yet that longing, we, there's something attractive about that. Power and meekness kind of married together. What John does in our passage this morning, he marries those things in Jesus. It's, it's almost as if, if you have an iPhone, and if you don't, I guess your other phones would do it as well, but I, I, I don't know, you know, right? So, like, there's like a feature on your phone, right? And so you can, it, it, video, it's called slow-mo video, right? So you can actually take your phone out and, and not take regular video, but you can move it over and do slow-mo video. And then what it does is it allows you to record video, but it, it also puts power in the hand of the user. You can determine which frames you want to slow down. And what happens when you record something in normal speed and then you put it through this slow-mo lens and what happens is things slow down. Facial expressions that you would have otherwise missed, they show up. The, you know, uh, the way people's eyes move, like just the hitting of the ball, like things just slow up and you're able to linger and see things that you would otherwise miss. Well, John's gospel, where we are right now, we're, we're in one of those scenes. And what's happening is if you know the gospel of John, it's 21 chapters. And so the first 11 chapters, John starts with, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He starts with eternity past. And then by the time you get to John 11, you not only see that Jesus is God who takes on flesh and dwells among us, but then you start to see this word of God 
and life and you see him moving and teaching and showing compassion and grace and performing miracles. And then by the time you get to chapter, John takes 11 chapters to do that. And then guess what happens when you get to chapter 12? From chapter 12 to chapter 21, it's one week. It's one week. John slows down. He slows his gospel down, not with the push of a thumb. He slows his gospel down with his pen. And he says, I want you to linger. I want you to slow down and see and take in what's about to happen in the rest of my book. And I want it to have the, that effect upon you where you see things that you would otherwise not see. You pay attention to things that we would otherwise miss. We, we, we notice things that we would otherwise move fast. You know, we would just blow by it. John says linger. And so in our passage today, I, that's what I want us to do. I want us to linger. I want us to look deeply. I want us to camp out right here and, and look at what he is saying about Jesus. And there's a lot he's saying here. But what I want to get at is John is saying that that this Jesus. He is strong and he is significant. And then he turns right back around. This same Jesus is humble and he's meek. And there's a reason why he is marrying these things too. Uh, together in this passage. And so the first thing I want to look at is the strength and significance of Christ. Uh, you know, it's obvious. Right. And so when you look at the context of it, you see it just by the sheer fact that that Jesus actually shows up in Jerusalem. Now, this is I don't want us to miss it because he says the next day, the large the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So just stop right there. Now, when you look backwards, you will learn that that Jesus was coming out of hiding that that I'm going to get to it in a second. But he had just done this miracle and this miracle. I mean, when people saw this miracle, I mean, they wanted to not only kill him, but they wanted to kill also the person that he performed the miracle on. And so Jesus goes into a small town called Ephraim and he just withdraws. He stays there. And Jesus knows that when he shows up out of hiding, it's going to be death. And the text actually says he came to Jerusalem. He knew that the clock was ticking and that his time was drawing near. He would not stay in hiding. He is not a coward. He is not afraid. He is strong. He is mighty. The second thing you see in terms of his strength is the actual miracle. And so John does what, what other gospel writers don't, that what they don't do. John actually tells you, why is this crowd there? Where did they come from? What's motivating this response? And so you would think that they're just, hey, Jesus is coming. Let's just throw up some palm branches. John says, no, there's something that just happened. And what just happened is pressing into what's happening in our text. And if you go back to John 11, then you know what just happened. You know what happened in John chapter 11. One of Jesus's closest friends has died and his name is Lazarus. And Jesus intentionally waits until Lazarus has been dead for several days. And then he shows up. And once he shows up, Lazarus's sisters are like, Jesus, where are you? Why, why weren't you here? Had you been here, he would live. And I know you could have healed him. And Jesus's words to them is it's not just me having power over a body to heal it. I want to push that envelope a little further. I want to show you that I have power over a dead body. And so I intentionally waited to let my friend die so that you will see the power of God. And so when Jesus shows up, the sisters are like, Lord, 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 I know he'll live again on the day of the resurrection. And then Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. And that I'm the life. And that when I show up right here and right now, I have that same power to call my friend out of the grave and I don't even have to go inside and get him. I just say Lazarus come out and Lazarus comes out. And so people saw this. And what did Jesus do? The text says that he withdrew. He went into a small town. Well, he actually came back to Bethany and they threw a party. And that's where uh, his, his, he was anointed. 
And guess who was there? Lazarus. Reclining, just kicking it, just chilling, like right there. Like, dude, you were just dead, and now you're like, at, you're at the table eating with us? And, and John says it in passing, they were just kicking it. And yet, people, the crowd, they heard. They heard and they saw, wait a minute, I know what he just did. And they saw Jesus vanish and go, and then word got out. This Jesus is back, and Lazarus is alive, and they are in that house having a party. And John says they followed. They went right to the house. And then guess what John says? They followed Jesus right into Jerusalem. That that's the crowd you see. This crowd, they've witnessed something. They have witnessed this man do something that no one has ever done in the history of the world. And that no one will ever do in the history of the world. He has called a dead man back to life. And I don't know about you, but if I see someone do that, I'm following. I'm going to follow you around wherever you go. Right. I, I got to get what you got, Doc. Like I just need to, you know. And so they follow. They, they're following him. And so it makes perfect sense that when Jesus is going into Jerusalem, they know what he's just done. And so when you read the text where they're saying like, Hosanna, 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 what they're saying is save us, save us, save us. Right. And they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Right. So in other words, they're looking at Jesus and they have this big miracle in their background. And they are hooked. And they are doing exactly what they did 170 years prior when another Jew named Simon the Maccabee, when he defeated uh, the Syrians and temporarily won their independence, the Jewish people greeted him the same way. They greeted him with palm branches. This was common. It was the worship of a king. It was the exaltation of a king. When a king shows up, this is what you do. You respond and notice what Jesus never does in this text. He never tells them to stop. As a matter of fact, when you read John's gospel, John actually says, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming. And so the Bible is affirming that what they're wanting is a king and what God is giving them is a king. And the Pharisees and Luke account of this, they're telling Jesus, Jesus, tell your disciples to stop trying to serenade you. Tell them to stop calling you king. And what does Jesus say? He says, I can't tell them to stop because if they stop, these rocks will cry out. In other words, Jesus is saying what? No, I really am king. I really am powerful. I really am mighty. I, I'm really this. I'm not denying it. I can't deny it. And it goes a step further. So you also see. There's some significance here to when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. When you read the text all over this passage, it, it's the Passover is at hand. And so John says it on five different occasions that what's happening right now is the Passover, that the Passover is about to happen in a few days. And this was one of this is probably the most significant feast in Israel's history. Because it had to do with their deliverance from Egypt. And so, you know, the story in Egypt, when, when you read the book of Exodus, it opens with what? Israel growing and growing and growing. And then Pharaoh wants to do what? He says, I want to I'm going to destroy all of your first, all of the male child who were under this certain age. In other words, Pharaoh is attempting to wipe out the, uh, the Jews or at least to keep them from having a king that comes up. And that, that, that starts a revolt and turns against him. And so his response to that is, let me stamp out all the, the baby boys. Now, the irony of all of this is the last plague, God flips that on him. That God actually says, no, as a matter of fact, you tried to kill the boys and I actually raised Moses in your own household. And he's actually my deliverer. So you talk about might and strength. You can't kill him because I won't let you kill him. And you're going to raise him in your own household. And then I'm going to turn around and use him as a deliverer. So God is like gutting him from the inside out. And then at the end, by the, by the, end, by the time you get to the end of Exodus, God ups him. God says, as a matter of fact, I'm going to kill your firstborn. And not just your firstborn in the, in the, in the castle, 
all the way down to the servant. And this was God's way of wiping out his kingdom. And that's exactly what happened. God told his people, look, this is what I'm about to do. You've never seen anything like this. I'm going to come in and I'm going to destroy the firstborn. And there's only one way out. You go find a lamb and he must be perfect. And if you can't afford one, you partner with your neighbors and y'all put your money together and you find one. And you purify yourself and you cook the lamb and you take the blood and put it on your doorpost. And whatever you don't eat, you burn up. And this is when Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. When this is happening. So either he is like crazy because God was so serious about these special holy days. Like, I mean, he was really serious about them keeping it. And so either Jesus is crazy or there's something more to why he's showing up. He's showing up. Not to celebrate Passover, but to be the Passover. While they're out there getting animals and, and, and making sure that they're blemish free and making sure that they're fit to sacrifice. Jesus comes right in and sort of sways this crowd from this feast right to him. And his whole point is, I'm the significant one. I'm the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The blemish freeness that you're looking for in this lamb, it's me. That, that, that ceremony was about me. I'm right here and I'm right here in your midst. You see it, there's significance to Jesus. And John wants us to see it. And there's another point in this passage that John actually talks about these strangers who just show up. Look at verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And they don't know what to do about it because foreigners could not take the Passover. If you go back to Exodus, the only way you could take it and you were not a foreigner is if you were circumcised and engrafted into the covenant community. And so when these guys show up, they don't know what to do. Like, whoa, buddy, you don't look like us. You don't talk like us. Why are you here? And so they're fumbling amongst each other and they finally go to Jesus like Jesus it's some dudes here looking for you and they don't look like us. And I don't know what to tell them. And you know what Jesus says? He says, at last. My hour has come to be glorified. Now, you know, John's gospel. There are at least four or five other instances in the gospel where Jesus says, my time is not yet here. It's not yet here. It's not yet here. It's not here when he performs a miracle, when he turns water into wine. It's not there when this Samaritan woman comes to faith. It's not there when he's being accused of blasphemy and they want to kill him and they try to seize him. And he says, but they couldn't lay a hand on him because it wasn't his time. And yet when you get to this passage right here, he says, finally, my time is here. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because Jesus was not just the king of Israel. It's significant because there's some 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 irony going on in John's gospel where the Pharisees, they're the ones who say it. Like, look at your Bibles. The Pharisees look at it in verse 19 and they look how John writes it. He writes it in verse 19 and then the Greeks show up and win in verse 20. This is some prophetic irony right here. These Pharisees are saying more than they understand. They're saying we can't stop him. The whole world has gone after him. And guess what happens? The whole world is literally coming up to Jesus right there when these Greeks show up. And then Jesus knows I'm not just the king of Israel. I'm the king of the world. My father has promised me the nations that on every continent in this world, there will be people who love me and know about me and worship me and desire me. And my father made that promise to me and my father has made good on that promise. Therefore, I can go and die now. I see it. I see it. My father is faithful. Do you see the significance and strength that John is sort of pushing in front of us to talk about Jesus? It's right here in the text, but that's not it. John flips it on us, right? Like you see this strength and this gravity and this significance. And then right, I mean, right when you think like, yes, he is strong and mighty. He's going to deliver us from, from Rome. And then you see this Jesus come in a lot of weakness. 
You see him walking, coming in on a donkey. Now think about it. Think about how our accolades affect how we present ourselves when we show up in public. So I'm thinking about like the Academy Awards or some of those other awards. You know how, you know how it goes. That there's red carpet treatment. That there's limos that literally come up to the front and let them off. That it, it's blocked off so that commoners like us can't be there. And these people get curbside treatment. They step out in very nice attire and they walk down the red carpet and all while they're walking, they're being interviewed. So you've been nominated for this. What do you think about that? And what are you wearing today? And the cameras are just going off. You would think that if Jesus and this is they, they made a, a CD. Or they've made a movie and we're talking about Jesus Christ, who's raised a man from the dead who is the fulfillment of all of scripture, if they're showing up like this, then you would think that Jesus would do better than a donkey. You would think that he would show up on a battle horse or a chariot, or maybe his servants are carrying him. And he does not show up that way. Like he shows up on a donkey and not just a donkey, a young donkey, which would have been an, a really absurd image he would have weighed more than the donkey, more than likely. He would have probably had to keep his legs up so that his feet would not scrub the ground. It was the biggest, I mean, just this, this contrast of power and might and strength and significance and then humility. Now, the question is, why a donkey? What did it communicate? In Jesus's day, if you wanted to do war with a country, you showed up on your horses. If you come in peace, you showed up on a donkey. You're not finna go destroy a, a city on donkeys. You don't do it. It communicated, look, so if, if this is my house and this is, let's say, 300 yards away and you're coming in and we got beef, then what you would do is, if, if we're about to fight, I'm gonna come in on a horse and you know the deal before I get there. But if you see me on a donkey, I'm coming to you before I, I even get there, I'm already communicating. Peace. Hands up. That's what's happening in the text. Jesus is coming. Hands up. He's coming. Empty. He's coming humble. And so the question is why? One is to fulfill scripture. This is his humility. He is actually fulfilling scripture as absurd as it seems. Jesus says, I will submit, Lord, I will put myself on a, a donkey, a young one at that, and I will ride into Jerusalem because your word says this is what your king does. And it doesn't matter what they say or think. I will obey you. Jesus is communicating humility to the people that as much as they want him to come in there and free them from Rome and to go in there and destroy and kill and take the throne, which he really could do because you just watched him raise Lazarus from the dead just by speaking it. So you, you, in your mind, his power is really limitless. And you're thinking he's the king of Israel. He's going to come in and free us. And Jesus says he comes in on the donkey and says, nope, that's not the throne I'm headed for. That's not that, that's not the enemy I'm trying to deliver you from. He says, you have a greater enemy. And it's not wrong. You got beef with God. And your sin is separating you from him. And his wrath is real and his wrath is serious. Therefore, the bigger need right here, it isn't political liberation. You need to be regenerated. You need to be saved. You need to be reborn. A debt needs to be paid. Justice needs to be satisfied. Righteous needs to be given to him. And Jesus says, I ride in on a donkey and I'm the one that's about to give it to him. But it's not just humility for the people. This is humility for the Lord, for his father. I mean, can you imagine what he's just done? Can you imagine? I mean, even when Satan tempted him, Satan is tempting him with power and, and, and use your power to turn this into food so that you can eat. And so it makes perfect sense that when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, man, I just raised somebody from the dead. Don't you know who I am? I'm the fulfillment of scripture. Don't you know who I am? And Jesus says, I know who I am. I just raised him from the dead. But you've sent me to die and I will die. 
that they're using their hands to wave palm branches and, and, and worship me, but I'm here to worship you, that I want to submit myself to your hand. And Jesus is riding this donkey in there and telling his father, I'm not turning back. Hands up. I will not usurp your authority. I will not challenge your power. I will not go another way. Hands up. I come to worship and I come in humility. I come to obey you. I come to listen. You see? Power, strength, significance, married to weakness and meekness and humility. And this is our king. And if you're honest, that is what you need. That fascination with seeing power and meekness bound up into one person. The reason those stories gravitate and pull towards you, it's because you were made for another story. You were made for a day and an age where you could know intimately the creator of the universe who created everything by the word of his power. Who spoke something into nothing. Who created everything we see and things that we don't see. And he didn't need to use hands. It was his words, his effectual, powerful word emanating from his powerful nature and character. And yet. This same God. You were meant to know intimately. He walks with us in the cool of the day, if you want to go back to Genesis. He doesn't speak at us. He actually takes his time to form man and woman out of the dirt of the ground. And he gets close enough and he breathes the breath of life in them. You see that? That power married with that humility and intimacy and closeness. The reason those other stories out there fascinate us is because we were made for another story. And what Jesus and what John is saying in the passage is your king is here. And he's mighty in battle and he is strong and he is significant and he is important and he is weighty and he is yours and he is humble and he is ten tender and they're bound up into one. How does the strength of Christ, the majesty of Christ, the significance of Christ, how is that soothing to your soul? Because John says, this is where I want you to linger. I want you to linger there and look at his majesty. Look at his power. Look at his strength. What are you afraid of? What, what, what brings you worry and sorrow? Is it death? Jesus says, I've overcome that. Next. Is it money? He says, I own the cattle in a thousand hills. The silver and the gold is mine. Next. What about the law? What about the law of God that is upon us and on us, accusing us and condemning us? Jesus says, I have quieted the law. I've kept the law. Next. I mean, we could spend here, uh, uh, an entire day here. What are the things as humans that terrify us, that undo us? And Jesus says, there is not one thing that you need that I don't have. Therefore, we walk with hope. We have hope. We have courage. We do not despair. Let me show you how it'll change your life when you... See the weight of God's power. We grew up in, and we stayed right behind RTS over in the Queens for half of my life. And then we moved uh, to North Jackson, the other half. And when we were uh, living in the Queens, my, my parents and my aunt, they got into fostering. And, and they didn't foster like infants, right? Like they fostered like, I see her shaking her head over there. <laughs> They, they fostered like, you know, the real, like, real deal, people with, and i never forget, man, we had a, 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 a foster boy. He was probably three years older than me. And, uh, I mean, you could just kind of tell, like, there was some stuff going on. 
And so we lived in the Queens and, and there was just this guy and he, he kind of bullied everybody. He was, I, I wasn't old enough. I never got attacked, but I had friends who were and he just kind of ran the neighborhood. And I remember when we brought Ken in, you know, we used to fight around the house and Ken would just, I mean, he would not fight back. Like he would literally like, and so I actually thought like I was something. I thought I was tough, right? Even though I was two years younger than him. And then something got, him and the neighborhood bully got into it. And I, I will never forget it. I can tell you what corner it was in the neighborhood. Man, he got off the bus, he dropped his book bag, and man, he got in this stance. And, I, and you could just tell, like I saw it, like I saw it. The moment he got in this stance to fight, I was like, dude, you've been holding out on me, right? <laughs> And when I say that he beat him down, because this guy was just trying to pick on him, pick on him, pick on him, and all of a sudden, he, I mean, he just, he whooped him bad. Now, what does that do, right? If you're in my household, and you know that your foster brother has just like beat up like the neighborhood bully, right? Do you know what it's like to walk outside now? You can't mess with me, dude, I'm gonna get my brother. You know, like, and we, man, we riding, we leaving our bikes outside. You're not going to steal them. I'm going to go get my brother. You know, like, it was just, it was just this security, this peace, this comfort. Do you know that you really do have an older brother in Christ who's fought for you? And there is not one thing that anyone or anything can do to you to harm you. He is strong, he is powerful, he is mighty, and he is yours if you have repented and turned from your sins to him. And if you're not a believer, you're in a hard place. I could name a hundred things that will destroy your life in a moment. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can turn in faith to Christ and have him and know him and love him. But the other thing about the passage is you see Jesus' humility. And what I love about his humility in the passage is not just his posture, but it's also the fact that he actually says, my soul is troubled. I mean, look at that. He is like telling us what's going on. He's like a Philly kind of guy, right? He's strong, but he's, co he's confessing, like, Father, like, I'm, 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 I'm weak right now. And it's not just the agony of the cross that, that, that's looming over him. It's not just the loss of life. It's the cutting off of relationship. He has known his Father intimately forever before the foundations of the world, and this is going to be a new thing. Wait a minute, Father, you're going to turn on me? I'm worried. I don't know how to exist without you. And he's afraid. I say this because what is it that keeps you from Jesus? What is it that's going on in your life that keeps you away where you do not feel that you can confess and draw near? What sins have you committed that are so big that he has not said, I am carrying them all of them. You do not have to stay in hiding. You can come out and you can come clean and you can confess this to me. See, we want to hide. We think that our sin is bigger than him and we don't realize that we have a really big, humble savior who bears the sin and weight of the world. I want you to linger there. Love his humility. Make much of it. Love his meekness. Think about it. Draw near to him. He's not there just to lead you and protect you. He's here to love you. Leadership, love. I'm going to close with this. How do you respond to this type of power and this type of humility? Jesus says it out of his, the words come out of his own mouth. I think when we think about Palm Sunday, we typically think 
about Jesus and power and glory going through and, and, and going to the cross. And that's good. Like it, it really is. We're, we're, we're talking about that. But there's something that Jesus says in this passage that it just kind of caught me off guard. He actually says, look down with me at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So right there, stop right there. Jesus is actually talking about what he's about to do. He says, you, you see a seed, unless the seed goes into the ground, there is no fruit. It does not come up unless this seed goes down. And what Jesus is saying, I'm going to go down. I'm going to go into the ground. I'm going to pay the penalty for your sins. Why? That life might come out of it. That you might have a hope and you might have sins atoned for and righteousness given to you and, and you might have it in the abundance. And so we think that that is all Jesus is talking about, what he's done. But look at the text. Look at what he says right after this. Whoever loves his life loses his life. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. You see what's happening? That this isn't just what he's doing for us. This is also an invitation to follow suit, to get behind Jesus and to die. To die to our pride, to die to the way this world thinks to die to needing the affirmation of men, to die to needing all these things, all of this power that we get in other places. Jesus says, follow suit, get behind me and die. And he says, trust me. Believe me. You'll lose your life, but you will gain it. He's actually putting before us how to make our lives matter, how to make Easter matter, how to make Holy Week, how to make it matter. He says, follow suit. This is an invitation for you and I to say enough. I'm tired of acting like I have it all together. I'm tired of trying to do life in my own strength. I'm tired of trying to work my way into heaven. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired of trying to hold it all together. He says, I invite you to die to that and to relinquish control. And that's what we were made for. To die to self and to need him. What I love about uh, a quote, and, and so that's the invitation. We respond. We meet his power and mercy with humility. We die. And he promises to, to bless us and to give us life. George Popovich, when, he, when this article came out that I'm talking about, he makes this startling statement at the end of it. And he says that the reason I love Kawhi, and he hates everybody, right? <laughs> I mean, he is just like, I mean, he hates everybody. He hates to be interviewed. And he wrote about this. He says, the reason I love him because it's, I've yet to find an athlete who has recognized the difference between greatness and stardom. He wants greatness badly. He doesn't care about stardom. You see, stardom says, look at me for all of my accomplishments. Make much of me. Greatness, you still need the accomplishments to be great. But greatness is... I will make much of you. I will serve you. Which savior do you think we have? Is he after stardom? No. He's after greatness. He's using his power and his strength and his might for us. Linger there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the way that it reminds us of your goodness. It reminds us of your power. I pray for those who are still trusting in self, that they would see that you are the fulfillment of scripture, that you are the one who holds life and death. It's in your tongue that you are the great Passover lamb, the one who takes away the sins of the world, that you are the humble servant who will lay down his life in submission to the father. None of us can do that perfectly. If we're all honest, we are prideful people. 
And yet we have a very humble Savior who has taken away our guilt and taken away our shame. Oh, Jesus, would you help us to see more of you? I pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen.